I was in occupational therapy thinking everything's fine. Everything's fine. And she pulled up a big monitor and that was just like a where's Waldo type thing with had pictures of cows and hearts and churches and bells. And she said, I want you to hit all the bells. And so, okay, yeah, that's fine. And I did it and I started doing it. And then I broke down in tears. (laughs) I just, that was my realization. Like, oh my gosh, something is actually wrong with me. I couldn't do it. I could see how easy it was, but I couldn't do it. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to the Recovery After Stroke podcast. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share, about your stroke experience, now is the perfect time to join me on the show. The interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. All you need to do to qualify is be a stroke survivor who wants to share your story in the hope that it will help somebody else that is going through something similar. If you are a researcher who wants to share the findings of a recent study, or you are looking to recruit people into studies, you may also wish to reach out and be a guest on my show. If you have a commercial product, that you would like to promote, there is a path for you too to join me on a sponsored episode of the show. Just go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, fill out the form explaining briefly which category you belong to, and I will respond with more details about how we can connect via Zoom. In today's episode, I am joined by Annika Luke, who experienced an ischemic stroke at age 44 that she describes as being the worst thing that happened to her. Annika Luke, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. Tell me a little bit about what happened to you. Oh boy, just jump right into it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess about a year ago, June 14th of 2022, I was exercising down in my basement as I pretty much do almost every single morning. And it was not an intense workout. I wasn't doing anything crazy. I was doing a HIIT workout from Apple. And um, I I don't even remember exactly what I was doing, something like jumping jacks or lunges or something. And suddenly the room sort of spun a little bit and then I got a headache. So I thought, okay, this is weird, but I've gotten migraines before. So maybe this is just a migraine. I stopped, well, I tried to keep going for exercising, but I thought, eh, I should probably just chill because the room calmed down. It was just a headache at that point. So I went upstairs and I took some medicine like I normally do and just continued on my day, still a headache, but you know, sometimes you just have a headache. Um, So that day was just as it was with a headache. And then the next day came still a headache. So I just, again, kept going, texted my boss said, Hey, I'm just going to be working from home. I've got this bad headache. And, um, I want to say it was probably the next day or the day after that the headache was still there. And so I said, you know, this is kind of unusual. I'll go to urgent care. So I went to our local urgent care center and I um, said, hey, I've got a migraine. I've had a migraine for about two days now. This is unusual for me. Usually they start to go down in intensity. I'm not feeling that. I'm still feeling really bad. And she said, well, it's probably a cluster headache. Let me give you some some sumatriptan and maybe you'll start to feel better. And so I did. I took that sumatriptan. It actually made the headache worse. And so then the next day I called, still I had a headache. I called back to urgent care, said, hey, you know, I've got this headache. And she she said, well, why don't you go ahead and go to the ER and they have a migraine cocktail they can give you there. So, okay. So I, you know, at this point, the headache was so bad. I was just vomiting and it was horrible. And I went to the ER, they gave me the migraine cocktail. It did make it feel better, but it wasn't, it still wasn't nothing. I still had a headache. and. um 
you know, I told them, I said, yeah, my hand feels really funny. My left hand feels like it's numb or like disassociated from my body. And they just like passed that off and said, okay, well, you can go home. And so I went home <laughs> and I, I want to say it was three days later was still the headache. I got in to see a neurologist. So, um, and I went to see her and told her all the symptoms. And I said, you know, there's something kind of weird too, is that I feel like I hear breathing. It's like somebody's breathing in my ear. Mm. And um, she just, and I said, you know, is that normal? And she kind of just shrugged her shoulders. And I said, well, am I hallucinating? Cause I don't like mouth noises. So I thought maybe that is just my way of being even more annoyed. So I, uh, I what just, <laughs> are you talking about chewing mouth noises yes i do not like mouth noises breathing <laughs> or like chewing really Fair close enough. to my ear <laughs> yeah. yeah so i i said you know that's how it she kind of just shrugged that off and thought nothing much of it and she looked at me after she examined me she did like a stroke ass assessment and you know said everything there was normal and I think you just have a long migraine and you're going to continue to have it for maybe 10 more days. And, uh, <laughs> and then she just sent me on my way with, um, it's this new drug that they have for migraines. So she gave me quite a few sample packs and I said, you know, I'm headed to, um, Colorado in a few days and I'd like to be able to go. And she said, well, here's enough sample packs take one of these just as uh, prophylactically so that you, while you're there, you take one every other day. And so she gave me enough samples for that. And I went on my way. <laughs> and then I want to say it was probably a day or two after that, where the headache was still there, still intense. And then I was trying to go to bed. It was the 22nd of June. So I started the headache on June 14th. And then the 22nd of June, I was going to bed. I couldn't sleep. My head hurt so badly that I ended up sleeping on ice packs. Just I got a bunch of ice packs and I put them on my pillow and really tried to sleep on them. And I still had a hard time sleeping. And I went downstairs and I wrote my family a note because, you know, I have two kids and the husband and he said, Hey, look, I'm not sleeping well. Just know that I haven't slept well and, you know, try to be quiet in the morning because <laughs> I thought they were going to get up make a bunch of noise and think, Hey, where's mom? Why hasn't she made our lunches or whatever it is that I, I normally do. And uh, so I wrote a note and then they kind of got off on their own. They went to school or camp at that time and I kept sleeping and then my husband came in and checked on me and he was concerned, definitely was concerned, but it was nothing. I wasn't acting that unusual. And that morning I did get up and I let the dogs out. I walked outside and, you know, I remember thinking, go to the bathroom dogs. Cause I really want to go back in. I had to like sit down. I felt really nauseous and sick and bad. And so I did that really quickly, went back upstairs, went back in my bed. And so anyway, my husband noticed after he took the kids to school that I was acting a little odd, but nothing that couldn't be explained by lack of sleep and having a headache for that long. <laughs> you know, it's just eventually getting to you. So that was kind of where we were. And he called the neurologist and said, you know, I think she's getting worse. Is there something more we should do? So she called in a prescription for prednisone. Then he went back to pick that up. And then she said, I know you're leaving soon for Colorado. Or he said that. He said, we're leaving tomorrow at this point how are, how are we going to leave? Is that okay that she still has this bad of a headache? And she said, yeah, you know, since you're traveling, maybe we should get you a CT scan. So um, 
you know, he, we were leaving. I can't remember when it was, but it was very soon after he had been talking to her. And so he called her back and said, you didn't make it for today. Like she wrote a prescription for the CT scan, but we couldn't get in today because she needed to write it for stat. So anyway, he called her back and said, yeah, I really am concerned. And I think that she needs to get in to see that, do the scan today. And so she did that. And then he drove me there. <laughs> As he was getting me ready for the, the CT scan, he noticed like things were just really not right. That I seemed to be uncoordinated. Um, I was like, kind of walking into walls on the left side of my body. And um, so he was, he was really, really concerned. Um, so anyway, he drove me to the CT scan place and he got me in there and he said, Hey, I think there's something really wrong. I think she might be having a stroke. And uh, they did a couple little stroke tests, you know, had me smile and maybe put my hands up. And uh, they said, yeah, I do think it is a stroke. And they did a scan and they confirmed it. And so then after they confirmed it, they were like, okay, we need to get her to the ER now. And we were really close to an ER, closer than it would have been for an ambulance to come rather than my husband to take, take me. So my husband ended up driving me to the ER. They called ahead and said, hey, we have this patient coming. And um, that is when they definitely confirmed the stroke and they started doing all the tests that need to be done. And um, they basically said, it's really bad. It's really not, not good. Um, and I can't remember what hospital we were in. I guess it was the ER where they, they thought that my brain was swelling to a point where it was really dangerous and they were gonna have oh. to do a craniotomy. So they actually um, medevaced me to a different hospital. And um, I was in the ICU there for a few days and then I was in, still in the hospital for another week or so, about a week total. Boy, you're, uh, we've been going for around 10 minutes and you, That's a long story. <laughs> Sorry. And and the tension, I could feel the tension building and building and building and building. And I'm thinking, okay, at five minutes, I thought they're going to get a help. She's going to work it out. That, that was a stroke. <laughs> and at seven minutes, I thought, no, no, they're going to work it out. It's it's definitely going to be a stroke. They're going to work it out. And at 10 minutes, and I'm, I'm thinking you, you are probably one of the most, uh, you're one of the people who's gone out of their way to make sure that you got help, which is usually the opposite is happening in these stories that I hear. People say, oh, it's nothing. Oh, I'm going to avoid it. Uh, I'm going to go to work or oh, I have this trip to go. They they do everything except go and get help. You've done the exact opposite. And it's still taken around 10 days or two weeks to get uh, a diagnosis, which is amazing that you were still able to keep going after that amount of time and then still turn up to hospital in a condition that was reasonable enough for you to even though you needed help to be on your feet and to uh, make your way to a hospital that's pretty amazing so yeah yeah <laughs> they've, they've discovered a stroke what kind of stroke was it it was an ischemic stroke uh, due to a carotid arter artery dissection. So we think uh -huh. that it happened during the exercise. To me, I'm not 100% sold on that is definitely the cause of it, but it must be. There's no other thing that I, I mean, the only other thing is that I was lifting 15 pound weights doing overhead presses uh -huh. uh, maybe the day before. So maybe I weakened the artery at that point. Um, but I, yeah, I really, it's surprising to me because I wasn't doing CrossFit or, you know, mm. crazy amounts of exercise. I was really rather tame in what I was doing. These pesky carotid arteries sometimes. I know. <laughs> they just don't 
behave the way they're meant to and the tears do occur and you hear about it. it's very very common actually uh but some people you hear they had a massive collision in uh in a motor vehicle and that caused a big uh like a whiplash type injury and then that caused it and then i've heard people annika that have just sneezed and caused a stroke <laughs> right I mean, so it's that doesn't in... leave me walking around feeling very happy about like how is it that I'm not going to do it again, you know? And I keep yeah. asking. I've gone to um, so many specialists. I'm actually talking to right now because I'm going to get a stent in my carotid artery mm -hmm. coming up here um, because since the stroke, I've heard my heart beat every single time it beats. Beats. It sounds like a squeak, uh -huh. um, and so talking to an interventional radiologist about, you know, that they, they, they focus on these type of things and like, how did it happen? And they don't really know. They just don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing that you said about listening, being able to hear your heartbeat, is that disconcerting? Yes. It's horrible. It's not like a, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. it's a squeak, squeak, squeak uh -huh. every single time my heart beats. I can't so, sleep. So what I do is I wear an earbud in, in this ear so that I have the ability to sleep. It's just playing uh, pink noise or brown noise yeah. all night long. And if it falls out, it'll wake me up. Right. Okay. Now, I know there are actual hearing aids specifically designed for people who have tinnitus uh, yes. and maybe for a similar condition that you're experiencing right now that cancel out noises in, for some people in some conditions so and they do stay in a bit better than an earbud uh, uh headphone for example yes uh now the other thing that's interesting about what you said is one of my coaching clients reached out to me and said well i've, I've been speaking to her for a couple of years about all her stroke related experiences and just recently she said i don't know what it is but I hear voices <laughs> and I thought, oh, oh what, what kind of voices? Are they good or bad? Well, she goes, no, they're not those type of voices. She just said she hears like, it's like background talking and she might be in her room on her own and she can hear background talking. And I thought, oh, that sounds a bit weird. I wonder if you need to go and see somebody about that. Anyhow, I reached out to the stroke survivors who follow my recovery after stroke page on Instagram. And I asked the question and because I didn't want to freak people out, I, I asked it like this. I said, this might sound like a strange question, but did you start hearing sounds of voices in your head after the stroke that you didn't hear before the stroke? And you won't believe the amount of people who responded and said, yes. <laughs> Well, that's weird. They have never heard of that. I don't think it's, it doesn't sound like a, like a murmur or anything. It sounds like a squeak, but that's, yeah. that's because however my carotid artery healed and I I've seen images of it. It's fascinating to me because they've done an angiogram. Mm -hmm. It healed very, very narrow. So it's more narrow, I think, than it was before. And so that's why just that blood getting through there is, is a problem. And that's another reason why I'm going to get the stent is that, you know, as things build up in your blood, because of that narrowness, I mean, it's like 90% closed off, uh -huh. um, that could lead to problems down the road. So the stent will actually help later on for uh -huh. potentially not having a stroke. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, has healed and because of the way that it's healed it has taken up more space inside the blood vessel i think so uh, yeah and therefore it's got a 90 percent uh reduced capacity yes yes okay all right and therefore that you're probably being asked to take a blood thinner of some sort yes. All day. Yep. I mean, not all day, every, every day. Yeah. And, you know, while I, if I get a stent, then I'll have to do two blood thinners. I'll do the aspirin and the Plavix. Yes. Okay. And how old were you at the time? I was 44 at the time. Mm. So I'm, I'm now 45. 
Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of anybody having had a stroke before then? Did you know anybody? No, <laughs> no definitely not. Yeah. And in fact, when it happened, even when they said it was a stroke, I I didn't believe them. And I would say I was delusional about it for, I want to say, two to three weeks. Like even in the hospital. I, and while I'm being medevaced, I just thought, why are they blowing this out of proportion? Like, clearly I'm okay. I mean, I went into the ER and I said, you know, I have a reaction to iodine contrast blood uh, for for doing scans, but you can give me gadolinium. And so obviously I had my wits about me. I was able to walk. So I thought, what? They're totally overblowing this. This is not a big deal. I will come back from this. Yeah. And that's a great thing to think, especially during a potentially difficult, scary time for a lot of other people. I'm curious, uh, you're going through that. What are you like? You know, how, how do you comprehend though? You are in hospital, you are unwell. I know you don't feel unwell or you don't sort of see yourself as being unwell. I was like that for the first uh, bleed that I had. I experienced a similar kind of, uh, what's the word? Not delusion, but false sense of uh, security. And people were coming to visit me and mm -hmm. I was walking around and I looked fine but I had a blood clot in my head <laughs> and the doctors and nurses were really trying to emphasize the point. You need to sit down. You need to rest. You need to settle. You need to not be walking around. You need to stay in our, in the ward because I was always down at the hospital cafe, catching up with people who were visiting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but your husband didn't, he wasn't so, he wouldn't have been so, nonchalant about it like you right oh no no he was he he was worried I mean he was talking to doctors and they were they were telling him how bad it was and um and he was kind of beside himself he actually called my neighbor who is a doctor and said you know this is happening and my neighbor super super nice guy he actually came to the hospital to visit not to visit but more to like help my husband because he wanted to talk to the doctors himself and then give it in normal speak to my husband so that he could sort of help interpret that you know english to english <laughs> yeah okay and so the kids how old were they um my son is now 15 he was 14 at the time and uh my daughter is 11 but she was 10 okay so my my kids were the exact same age how did you guys manage that part of the process i don't remember dealing with that part of the process too much because i wasn't really in a good state to be doing that type of thing although i was probably trying to allay their concerns and just tell them, oh, i've got a bit of a i was yeah. just trying to play it down how did you guys manage that sure so um i remember my husband talking to me about this um, when we were in the hospital, um, but basically we were going to go to Colorado and we were going to go with some really good family friends and they have two kids. And, um, we decided that the kids would go to Colorado with the family friends to, you know, they didn't need to be there. And that was, you know, maybe nervous for the, make, making them nervous. So we just thought, all right, let's go ahead, let them enjoy their vacation. And I, being as delusional as I was, thought I'll meet them there. They'll go and then we'll go too. <laughs> we'll just go a couple days later after all this blows over. And even while I was in the hospital, I was saying, all right, when are we going to Colorado? And my husband was pretty, pretty blatant about, no, we're not going to Colorado. And I said, but why not? I'm fine. And he said, because it's not here. This is where you need to be. <laughs> I was like, they have healthcare in Colorado. <laughs> that would be fine. 
So I really thought I was going to go. And even after he said no, I thought, well, we can just drive there. Maybe you don't want me flying because, you know, I know that that's a potential problem. And even while I was in the hospital, I bought compression socks thinking that I was going to go to Colorado and had them delivered to my house. <laughs> wow. That's so cool. I like it. It's not so bad that you're delusional. That kind of helps the situation. I felt like me being a little bit disassociated from the seriousness of the situation made it easier for me when I was in hospital. It didn't help the people that were visiting me, my family and my parents didn't help any of them with the situation, but it certainly did help. Uh, it certainly did help me to be more, more, more calm. I suppose the word is. Yeah. Yeah. I would say calm. And, and that's true. I was, I was pretty calm and chill about the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, this is not my first go around with health problems. So I just thought, well, it's just a little blip. You know, everybody has a little blip and yeah. let's keep going. Yeah. So at some point you went through the whole hospital process and you were sent home. Were you, when you went home, did you go home with any deficits? What did the stroke uh, do to you? Yeah. So I went home, not like I said, about a week after and, um, so they did outpatient therapy for me, uh, even though my husband really wanted them to do inpatient therapy. I, th I think outpatient was the right way to go. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called Seven Questions to Ask Your Doctor About Your Stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com, and download the guide. It's free. I did outpatient therapy, both occupational um, speech and um, what's that physical therapy? So I did all of that. And I would say it was actually, that's when I broke my delusion. <laughs> that's when the, the delusion was broken because I was in occupational therapy thinking everything's fine. Everything's fine. And she pulled up a big monitor and that was just like a where's Waldo type thing with had pictures of cows and hearts and churches and bells. And she said, I want you to hit all the bells. And so I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. And I did it and I started doing it. And then I broke down in tears. <laughs> I just, that was my realization. Like, oh my gosh, something is actually wrong with me. I couldn't do it. I could see how easy it was, but I couldn't do it. And, you know, I, I remember thinking I've never been the smartest person in the room, but I held my own. I was capable. And now all of a sudden I can't find the bells. <laughs> so that, that was, that was a tough blow for me. Right. That was the moment that you realized there was something wrong with your head what specifically was the thing that you realized for me i i remember introducing myself into a course that i went and sat in about three or four months after my second bleed and i, had, mm -hmm. I was really cognitively affected and i remember my biggest concern was that i didn't know if i was going to get my brain back to, yes. the, to the to the way that it was when I took it for granted, when I didn't know I had a brain and I just went about my business, right. what, what was your specific uh, concern? 
yeah, getting, getting my brain back and being able to do all the things that I used to do and wanted to do. Mm. Um, and I even tried working sh shortly after that, cause I worked from home and I, I struggled. I couldn't, I couldn't do something simple. And then I just took a break and said, okay, hang on, let's see what happens and just let it chill. I tried too soon. I want to say I was out of the hospital for a week and I was trying to go back to work. Everything's fine. Nothing to see here. Yeah. And um, yeah. What kind of work? Uh, I'm a web developer. So I work okay. for a company doing all their websites. Yeah. That's intense. It's just a lot of focus. Thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Concentration and computer time, monitor time. Yeah. And my typing wasn't great at first. Like I could type, but it was my left hand that was a problem. And anytime I went to hit the A button, I would hit the caps, caps lock and yeah. everything after I'd be shouting, you know, at That's the person. Right. That's exactly <laughs> my situation still. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And it's, it's frustrating. It's like, no, I I think I've overcome that now. I don't remember it happening recently. I think I can type. Okay. Now. Yeah. That's still my situation. Cause I've got um, numbness in my left hand. So mm -hmm. my hand doesn't really know where it is on the keyboard and yeah, thank God for autocorrect uh, for me because I just right click and then autocorrect because if I had to go back and stop all the time to spell correctly yeah it would be <laughs> a lot longer process to do an email or type a paragraph or whatever so i just allow, allow myself to type the whole thing even though it's wrong uh, mm -hmm. and then just auto correct so that it's quicker otherwise if i had to look down at the keyboard all the time it would just be too annoying um, <laughs> you're a web developer does that mean you were coding yeah, I was I was coding and just doing like front end stuff. Yeah, uh -huh. and coding's a a language, is it not? Is it another way yeah, to I kind of I do less coding now, more management of the websites. I mean, uh -huh. I can still get in there and do the code, and uh -huh. I do from time to time, but it, that's less intense it's when we're building the site that you really do a lot of coding and then as the sites become more self-sufficient for lack of a better word um yeah there's more management and seeing you know which products are up there let's change this let's change the description let's make this one out of stock that type of thing uh -huh. so and at the time i was re-scanning something so i was more just uh -huh. making it look different yeah uh-huh so you went back, attempted to go back to work immediately after your hospital, uh, you went home from hospital. It was about a week later. The kids, are they still in Colorado at that time? Uh, no, they came home and um, then I was just working from home. And then how did and you I think they were in camp after that. Uh-huh. So how did you handle the kid situation? Because they would have thought, our oh, strike's not a big deal. We left. She was in hospital. We came home. She's back. Uh, yeah. How did you manage that whole thing with the kids? Because teenagers are a pain in the butt under normal circumstances. <laughs> when you've had a stroke, it's even harder to, for me, it was even harder to cope with teenagers. Mm -hmm. How did you transition when they came back? Was it difficult? Did you have to change the way you went about things? I don't think I did so much. No, I mean... I feel like we weren't great about explaining what was going on. And because I seemed to be healing okay, we just sort of kept going. And I did have a hard time with times. Like, especially if somebody told me, you know, 445 or quarter till or the quarters, those drove me crazy. And that I would have to leave 45 minutes before that or 30 minutes before that, that time calculation was really hard for me. 
anything with those 15 minute intervals just really got to me. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so they kind of had to help with that. I mean, they knew obviously that things were wrong, but I feel like we could have done a better job explaining to them. And I think we did. Um, my husband was wonderful, like beyond wonderful. And my sister actually was staying with us for a little while too. So um, she helped out quite a bit with just like picking kids up from camp or getting dinner ready. And I also had a really uh, great group of friends that organized meals for us for, I want to say we had meals for two months afterwards, just so I didn't have to do any of that, which was great. It's a big yeah, relief. That's messy. It's one of my pet peeves. I hate making dinner. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> I don't think you're going to lose friends by announcing that. <laughs> Most people are probably going, I'm with you, Annika. I hate making yeah. dinner as well. <laughs> yep. uh, I'm one of those people. I'm home earlier than everybody. So I'm home at 3.30 to 4 o'clock in the evenings. Nobody gets home before me. And I thought that was an advantage when I was choosing careers and creating uh, a work, my own business and all that kind of stuff. It's not an advantage because I get I get to work at 7.30. And then my day doesn't stop until after six thirty when everyone comes home, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm as I as I get older, I'm starting to resent it more. I'm starting to resent my decision to be the guy who's at home that has to prepare everything and make dinner, and because there's no point doing it when my wife gets home at six thirty and then starting the dinner preparations because they'll never end. They'll, I'll we'll still be going at nine. So yeah, and they, they want to eat dinner every night. It's really oh, bizarre. Like, my I God. Think you have to come up with it again. <laughs> you get it. Oh my God, these kids. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Husbands and wives and oh man. It's unnecessary. And it is, I know, a big issue with people who have stroke and try to then explain that to the family. Cause I, I appeared normal the way I'd always appeared. And then trying to get through a task like dinner was really hard, but it became important to me because I would be at home doing nothing all day and then making sure that I had energy to go out, pick up some of the ingredients and then make dinner. So at least we ate together uh, mm -hmm. when they were, right. when they were still eating dinner at home with us. And um, it was a good thing to have to do as a, I'm not sure if the words as rehabilitation or, as to have something to do because I had a lot of downtime in almost three years that I went through the process before my brain surgery. I had a lot of downtime, so I needed to occupy my time with something. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a lot more of a chore because it's also around the same time that I was really tired. My day was coming to an end and fatigue was kicking in. It was a real challenge. Yeah, I I think that it was a challenge for me at the beginning, but I wanted to prove that I could do it. So, um, you know, when the kids went back to school, I really made it a point to get up with my son. He goes to school at 7 a.m. His uh, school starts at 7.15 or something. What? And I made it a point to get up and see him off because and make lunches during that time. Cause I felt like that was what I did. You know, I was a mom and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make sure that I kept that up. I didn't want the stroke to make it come to an end. I was so tired. So, so tired. I've never been that tired as I was after my stroke. And, you know, I've been pregnant and that is, really tiring <laughs> but this was a whole other level but i really did try to keep that up and keep the routine in yeah so even to me you seem pretty calm mild-mannered it's been about a year you seem to have come a long way i, I suspect though that there's a little more still going on under the surface did it change the way you think about life how did it impact you on a personal level, on an emotional yeah. level? 
um, no, definitely it impacted me. So I would say, you know, as far as like speech, occupational and physical, all that stuff came relatively easy. Like I had to have a walker for a little tiny bit. Um, but basically the physical therapy, I was talking to her more about what I can do not to like hurt my carotid artery again, not how do I get back to walking? Cause I was able to walk. In fact, I carried the walker around just as like lifting it up because I didn't want to fall down and not have something to fall down on, but I didn't need it to actually walk or balance. So, um, yeah, all of that came relatively easy. And then for a long time, like we mentioned before, I was tired. That was my biggest problem. And just being around people socially was really hard and draining. Mm -hmm. So that was difficult. Um, and then I would say October was when really everything just crumbled. Um, October was, it's normal to have this apparently, but the where my stroke hit was in my parietal lobe. And the specific part of it was not in my thalamus, but it did hit that somatosensory cortex, which um, does impact how you feel things. And because my body can't feel correctly, it's just sending the pain signal. So I have pain down the left side of my body. The entire left side of my body is tingly and feels as though it's been burned. Mm -hmm. That's um, how I describe it. Yeah. It's, and that to me was crazy because I thought things were going well and you know a little numbness not a big deal but in October when this started creeping in that was a tragedy I couldn't imagine that I was going to have this pain for my mm. whole entire life mm -hmm. and at that point I really put my foot on the gas it's like okay we're going to fix this we're going to do therapy and how are we not going to overcome this of course we can overcome this. Everything I've read tells me that, you know, the brain is this amazing thing and you can grow it at any time. You can change it. And there's neuroplasticity. And I thought, okay, I'll fix it. So I really did a lot of research and I've tried a lot of different things in order to overcome this pain. So um, I tried something called non-invasive brain stimulation, which is basically trying to do hit your motor cortex in a way that makes the pain feel better. It's worked with people with fibromyalgia. And um, so I tried that and I did that every day. And I did it paired with mirror therapy because I wanted to try to train my left side of my body to feel the way my right side of my body does. So I set up this thing in my basement where I had a mirror set up and then I put my hands in so that they looked like it was a mirror image of it and did that every morning for about 20 minutes every day. And I would wear the device on my head while I exercised because, and this is, this is the thing, like I did go to Johns Hopkins and I said, Hey, I want to be involved in your NIBS program, your non-invasive brain stimulation program. And they said, no, you don't have any deficits that we can fix with this. And I thought, I, that's insane. I have a deficit. This is a big problem. It really, really hurts. And um, they just oh. said, no. So I took matters into my own hand. I got my, uh, my own TDCS unit. I found out where my M1 motor cortex spots are and measured my head and really put them into a place where I thought would be where they needed to be. And so I did that while I was exercising. And then I did it while I was doing mirror therapy. I would say I wore it for about 60 minutes every day. And what did you notice? Nothing. 
I was hoping um, you weren't going to say that, but I was expecting you I know, were say that. I know. I, I st still am hoping that that's not the case. But um, yeah, I, I did it for probably three months, thereabout. Mm -hmm. And then I went on vacation where I couldn't do it. And I didn't notice any difference. Yeah. And I thought, you know, if I'm doing it all this time and I haven't noticed any improvement, I thought maybe I would notice it when I stopped that more pain would come, but I didn't. The cerebellum and the motor cortex are probably in the, they, they kind of near each other in some parts mm -hmm. of the brain. And I imagine that when they operated on my head to remove the faulty blood vessel, they may have gone in via the motor cortex or they were near it or they interrupted it or they did something to it. Because when I woke up from surgery, I had exactly what you described on the left side, tingling, mm -hmm. numbness, burning, all at the same time. And that meant that I couldn't walk because my leg didn't know where it was in the world and it wasn't sending feedback from the floor to my head to tell my head that it was on the ground. And therefore my arm wouldn't work properly and all that stuff. So the rehabilitation has worked really well. And I've got movement back, mm -hmm. arm back, all that stuff. The, the thing I experience is the left side gets tenser and tighter because it's overcompensating all the time to make sure that I stay upright because it does feel completely different from the right side. And, and then that makes the muscles um, tense. And then that makes my balance go off. And then that has like a cascading effect of things that interfere with the way that I feel stability. Uh, so the solution to that is to get a massage and try and loosen and loosen all the tension from the left side and then try and balance it with the right side. And mm -hmm. if somebody, if I go to a massage and, you know, you get these really fluffy, gentle massages where they barely, yeah, uh, like barely that. touching you, <laughs> they're, they're killing me. That is so hurtful so painful that i need to go i book in for the most deepest hardest whatever you want to call it version of a massage that i can get because then that doesn't hurt as much um, yeah. what that does is relieves the pain of the muscles and actually creates relief instead of causing sensory pain and sensory burning uh right type of uh, responses and i remember going into physical therapy where they were teaching me how to walk again and they wanted to retrain they said my uh my left side so that it's not interpreting soft touch as burning as difficult etc so the way they would do that is they would get a really rough towel that's come say out of the washing machine without fabric softener mm -hmm. and then they would just rub that up and down my leg and my arm for 30 minutes to to desensitize supposedly my left side so that it doesn't so that it's not so that it's, so, so that they reprogram this sensation that you and I are feeling into we'll call it normal I don't know what you know something less painful has that and, helped no not at all <laughs> and yeah. it was so frustrating because i would have to go there and say to him guys this is not working i did this for about 10 or 11 sessions or something mm -hmm. and i would just sit there and just be completely irritated you know on my left side they would just annoy the heck out of me and make it painful the whole time and i would get zero result um and then recently so for me or i i went through all of that in 2014 and recently my friend who helped me through my, because he's a radiographer, who helped me through my recovery, my MRIs, all my scans through the hospital that he was working at at the time. His daughter, who was 17, had a bleed in the brain, almost in the same spot as me. And she has the same deficits now on the left side. And I was talking to my friend who's very well medically aware because he's a radiographer. He's been a radiographer for his whole professional life. And he said to me that the doctors told his daughter that we're going to retrain the brain so that it 
doesn't so that so that it stops thinking that sensitive touch is bad and et cetera. And and they were just telling her this routine that they told me about how I was going to get my sensation back on my left side. Mm -hmm. And I just had to break the news to him. I said to him, Chris, I, I'm not sure that you're going to get a result and that you guys need to keep pushing that because I have not met anybody who has had the deficits that we've got now, his daughter and I and you that we're talking about that has been able to get back the normal feeling on the left side or the right side. It just right. hasn't happened. It doesn't happen. It looks like, it sounds like, and I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. It sounds like that it's the one thing that's permanent is the way that my left side is always going to feel. And yeah, I'm trying not to believe that though. Like, yeah. I, I still feel like I can get better. Yeah, you can. I, I agree with you. You can improve. And one, one of the things you also can improve with is the way that you experience your left side it doesn't have to be so, uh, it doesn't have to make you down as much as it does. And that's where right. I've improved. So some days, believe it or not, Annika, I don't notice my left side. Hmm. And no, then, I, like, there yet, but yeah. I, I hope, <laughs> and, and that's a, that's a cognitive thing, right? That's a mental, a mental thing. It's not that my left side has changed. It's that I've changed the way that I respond to it and experience it. And then I have to catch myself every once in a while and going, Oh, I haven't noticed my left side. Oh, damn it. Now I've noticed it. Yeah. No, I, well, what I do all day is I alternate between hot and cold because I can feel yeah. hot and I can feel cold. Uh -huh. I cannot feel warm and I cannot feel cool. Uh -huh. So I have ice packs that I touch and I have like things you put in the microwave, heating pad type things. Mm -hmm. And I play with them. And that's one of the ways that I like relax at night is I'll sit there and touch them with both my, both hands. So that they're trying this, the left hand is trying to learn what the right hand is feeling. Yeah. And I've noticed that it actually makes it feel better because especially yes. when it's really cold, it, it's a sensation. Yes. The left side is not getting a sensation. So when it does, it's really happy about that. Yes. And I've thought of, um, you know, like they sell those little mats that you can lie down on. They're like acupuncture puncture mats uh -huh. thought maybe I should try that because sometimes I'll just take a brush and brush my hand to get that sensation on my uh -huh. hand uh -huh. is that sensation okay to feel is it annoying is it painful at all um it doesn't bother me I would I would say like you the light touch really mm. does so like mm. um I wear only tights now basically or shorts uh -huh. because if a, my pant leg rubs up against my le my left side yep. it hurt yep. and so that's bothersome to me so yeah i really don't wear every like all my clothes anymore <laughs> i've had an argument and i'm not sure if it's possible for anyone on the planet to ever have this type of argument with my wife about the bed sheets <laughs> Because some bed sheets that were gifted to her by her mother made me feel really uncomfortable in bed and I couldn't sleep. <laughs> and I said, do not put these bed sheets on the bed anymore. They are terrible. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. She, yeah. They have to be nice, smooth sheets. Yeah. Cotton, you know, whatever. And she thought that I was saying her mother's bed sheets were terrible throw them away you know get rid of them i was just saying i can't sleep with these bed sheets they make my left side feel really uncomfortable and painful and mm -hmm. as a result of that feeling on my left side i also sleep on my left side now because if i'm sleeping on my left side the weight of my body is creating that hard sensation whereas mm -hmm. sleeping on my right side the sheets are creating that soft touch sensation and it's a real big problem i can't deal with it and it stops me yeah. from sleeping 
well, be careful with your neck. You don't want to get in some <laughs> weird position. No carotid artery dissections for you. <laughs> no, I can't sleep on my back. So I do have a pillow that supports my neck and all that type of thing. But yes, it is such a dramatic thing to have the wrong bed sheet for me. It's such a problem. Uh, and yeah, I understand. I like travel. I, I try and avoid all things that make me be out of my comfort zone, but that's probably not a good thing either. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't want to end up in my fifties being one of those grumpy old men who are bothered by everybody and everything. It's way too early to be like that. I'm only, yeah. I, I'm not 50 yet. I don't want to get there uh, until I'm 80 or something. You're, so you're able to exercise, walk, run are you able to have you been able to get back to that even though your left side feels a bit strange yes yeah well i don't i've never i stopped running a long time ago i was a runner right after college and then when i was 34 i actually had my hip replaced because i had hip dysplasia um so i don't run anymore uh -huh. but i was doing hit workouts and strength workouts. And I was actually trained as a personal trainer and I taught spin class and Pilates for a while. And uh, so, yeah, I've gotten back into my exercise. I don't teach or anything anymore, but uh, yeah. How does the looking forward from here, how does the future look? What are you excited about? Um, well, I think I've really come to realize what I'm grateful for. So for a while, when the, the pain really hit in, and then I realized like, this is, this is it, this is the rest of my life, I'm going to be feeling this. I really took it to go to meditation. So I started doing meditation mm -hmm. and gratitude meditations in particular. And, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm just grateful that, you know, I have everything that I have. <laughs> I have a wonderful family, a really good family and friends. And, you know, I'm just so happy that I, I have that and I want to enjoy that. And so I really, um, I want to travel a lot. I, we've done a couple trips recently and that it felt good to be able to do that. And I know my husband likes to travel, so he and I will be doing that in our retirement future if we get to that point, if we're lucky enough. Yeah, perfect. Uh, what's the hardest thing about stroke? Um, just the loneliness of it, you know, oh. the, like not wanting to burden everybody with like this I mean, my poor husband had to hear me talk about stroke for every walk we went on for a long time. Um, but, and even though he's so empathetic and so good, it's just, and I have great friends that I could lean on too, but there's just still something so isolating about it. Wow. A lot of people describe exactly what you said, that it's stroke is isolating. And I'm not sure, I, have, I haven't been able to understand specifically why it's isolating, but I felt, I still feel that. I felt that, I still feel that. I still have moments where I'm not trying to be annoying or painful or weird or anything, but you just don't get it. I just can't express, and I don't want you to get it. You know, these are conversations that I'm having with people, right? I just don't want right. you to get it, but I need you to get it. And I know you're <laughs> never going to get it. But it's so hard to be me and yeah, I've never felt it harder to be me because I felt like previously when it was hard to be me, it was because of something I concocted that wasn't a real thing that if I changed my mindset or if I had another opinion, I could redirect and take a different path and it would be fine. I could resolve that particular matter that was ailing me. But right now, this thing that happened to me is not something I can uh, divert away from. It's following me everywhere I go. It doesn't matter what I do. 
Yeah. And you always wonder, like, if, if I said something stupid, was that because I had mm. a brain injury or did I just say something stupid because sometimes I say stupid things? Like, you never know. I mean, I always fumble over my words and stuff. So that has nothing to do with the fact that I had a stroke. It's probably just who I am. But you always question your own choices and your own mm. mentality. Like, are you okay? <laughs> yeah fear of having another one that that really does loom over you you know uh, like i don't want to do anything stupid <laughs> does that mean that you're making different decisions about how you go about being physical uh, and... um, no because i'm back to doing hit workouts and stuff and in some ways i even think about it as therapeutic yeah. because where it hit in my brain when you hit that parietal lobe there's a lot of in there that does like not only feeling and sensation but it's also where you are in space yeah. so oftentimes when i'm working out i'll sort of stop and guess where i am and then look down uh -huh. just to like test myself because i feel like that and also balance is important too so I think that when you're working out, if if you're gaining that balance, you're actually growing that part of your brain as well. Yeah. So there's a lot that is beneficial to the exercise. I don't lift heavy weights anymore, especially over my head, but I still do work out daily. Yes. Okay. And I, I walk quite, quite a bit. I would say I, I do about a mile in the morning and a mile in the evening. Exercise is so important. It's one of the most important things. If you can get any version of exercise done, no matter what your deficits are, no matter how bad stroke has impacted you, if you can just get physical in some way, shape, or form, uh, that really does support the brain to uh, grow new pathways, to recover, to heal, to do all sorts of things. It's really useful. Um, yeah, definitely. In the last 12 or so months have you had many trips back to the hospital thinking oh my gosh what is this in my head what's happening i should go to the hospital and get it checked out uh i have not gone back to the hospital but even just this morning i had a, a headache that seemed unusual and i thought what is this and i think it's just allergies quite honestly uh -huh. but made me pause definitely made me think twice about it and i, I feel like i should definitely go talk to migraine suffers about the possibility like hey this could be a problem because it's you're so easily dismissed if you're a migraine sufferer but if i just would have asked i want to scan i think they would have found it sooner yeah. and i think the whole thing could have potentially been avoided because it was the clot that broke off that caused the, the stroke so had they discovered the dissection, which really the the big tip off there was the breathing noise that I was hearing was actually that carotid artery was making a whooshing noise as it was going past the tear. So that, and I, I sort of kicked myself a little bit too, because I know, I know that I need to do my own research and really be my, my best advocate. Yeah. I should have done more. Yeah, but you never planned for having had a stroke and needing to do the research about that. No, never, never knew no but that. if I had done the research about the yeah. hearing a noise, a whooshing noise yeah. in my left, I would have, I would have potentially been able yeah. to figure that out. But, yeah. you know, I'm not medically trained. No, <laughs> you're just a regular person. Are you hard on yourself because of that? Do you... Um, I don't know. You always just question your your own okay. actions of what you could could have done differently, and okay. I think I should have just asked for more. And I think being who I am, which is like, no, everything's fine. I think I was accepting of their answer of you're fine, go home. Here's some samples type of feeling. Whereas I should have said, no, I'm not fine. This is not a normal headache. What has stroke taught you? 
Oh gosh, what has it taught me? If anything. To keep going, you know, grit uh, has always been important and something I hope I instill in my children. But really that's that's a key part of life in general. And that's how you're successful. You just keep going. Just put one foot in front of the other, do the next right thing. Yeah. And if someone listening is really early on in this journey, they've just had a stroke, they've just come home, let's say they stumbled across our, our interview, what do you want to tell them about the journey ahead? Sure. Enjoy the things that you can enjoy. Try not to think too much about what the future is going to hold because you, you just don't know. Enjoy those little things. You know, I've been so happy to have my children, my husband, my dog. You know, I get a lot of joy out of them. And I think that everybody has those little joys. About those moments, isn't it? It's about the moment that you're in right now. For example, right me, I'm really enjoying our conversation and I get to do it once a week at least. Uh, I've done it for the last nearly three years, once a week for the last three years. And I'm really grateful that I had a stroke that led to a podcast that is me speaking with other stroke survivors who get me, makes me feel less alone. And it makes me not have to tell my wife about it again <laughs> and again and again and again for 10 years solid. Yeah. Yeah. I was a little worried about coming on here because I always feel like all your um, guests really seem really profound and like almost happy that they had a stroke. I, I, I still am going to hold the stroke as the worst thing that ever happened to me. And I'm going to keep it there. <laughs> you do that. You do that. Um, and let it, let's see what happens with it. And the reason I say that is because you, uh, you might know that I'm about to release a book that's called strokes, the best thing that happened to me, but the very beginning of the book makes it very clear when stroke happened to me, that was not the best thing that happened to me. It definitely was the worst thing that happened to me. And it's the evolution of my life and how I've grown and developed that led to stroke in hindsight becoming one of the best things that happened to me because my life has a clear trajectory change. And it would never have happened if it wasn't for the stroke. It really never would have happened. I would have just went about being my neanderthal old self and i would have struggled with all of the pretend pretending and all the stories that i used to tell myself about why life was hard and difficult and from a from a physical health perspective and a mental health perspective it motivated me to do all to do better in every aspect of my life, to look after my nutrition better, to look after my mental health better, to attend to my emotional health, to mend my relationships, uh, to make better connections with people, to let people go from my life that were not serving me. Uh, so it is an opportunity for growth is what I'm basically trying to sell to people is, you know, this is an opportunity for post-traumatic growth and you might not see it yet and you might not know how and you might not know where it's going to come from. But the simple fact that you decided to reach out and get onto a podcast and share your story, I mean, that's a really cool thing. and. If you listen back to the podcast, you might find that some of the things that came out of your word, out of your mouth, are are profound words. Possibly, but yeah. <laughs> we'll maybe leave it at that because I, I still think worst thing 
but you know what if even if it is the worst thing it still means that everything else is better and isn't that happy ah, isn't that great yeah see there you go that's perfect well on that note thank you so much for being on the podcast thanks for having me that's a wrap we're done All right bye what a lovely chat. Thank you so much. I'm going to edit this and put it up. It'll go up in a couple of days. There's not another podcast ahead of this. I'll use the images that you sent me uh, for promotion. And, and even though you've sent some message, images already, you will receive an automated email because I'm dealing with stroke survivors and I have to completely remind them all the time. You will receive an auto, automated email that asks for all this stuff again. But if you've already done it, just ignore it. Okay, sounds good. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. To learn more about my guests, including links to their social media and other pages, and to download a full transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. If you would like to support this podcast, and I would really love it if you do, please leave a five-star review and a few words about what the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. If you are watching on YouTube, comment below the video, like the episode, and to get notifications of future episodes, subscribe to the show on the platform of your choice. Also, if you are somebody who has already left a comment and responded to one of my episodes, thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. It makes a massive difference to the algorithm and what that does is put the episode in front of people who need to see the episode uh, for example stroke survivors who are searching for this type of content once again thank you for being here and listening i really appreciate you and see you on the next episode importantly we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience and we do not necessarily share the same opinion nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed all content on this website and any linked blog podcast or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of bill gassiamis the content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call triple zero if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.